At one example I just want to share right now is the uh, model constitution. Uh, it came out decades ago as an attempt to bring unity in the church. Part of that, and it, is, and it was even voted that it was expected that all organizations deal with the bold print in that model constitution. Part of that bold print is a statement that says that your organization will be in compliance with all, North, with all general conference policy. It seemed very uh, unimportant at the time. However, in reality, that statement itself takes away the rule of the constituency. Uh, to be able to say that we now are accountable to a higher organization above what our constituents might vote. And I really wish that this body would consider recommending to the unions and conferences in this committee to remove that part of the model constitution from their constitutions and be sure that their constitutions ensure self-governance by the constituents of that specific organization. It is not meant to be a lack of respect toward those at the top, but we were set up as a Protestant organization to be run by the constituents. And that simple example is just one that uh, shows that we are moving away from that. And I think it is a dangerous proposal. This document is a policy voted by the GC. We were all there. I mean, those who were representative of the GC. Everybody participated. And then a vote was taken. When the vote is taken this way, I think those who, do, who lose for whatever thing we do, we have to graciously accept it. It concerns me greatly, and I stand in, in total disagreement with the document and what happened. In short, we are a divided division, and we are a divided church. Speaking for women, I don't know that we've heard their voice. I'm not speaking for every woman, but I'm speaking for the women that have texted me, who have called me, who have written me, and they feel very um, oppressed, very undervalued, and, and very much disillusioned with our church. Since Battle Creek, uh, our conference has been receiving calls asking how can we pay tithe to the church without it going to the general conference. I mean, that's, uh, and we have told them that uh, we are, you know, we're, we're doing what we need to do and, and we will continue to support the world church. I never planned that I'd ever be a part of a union that would go against the action of the world church. However, I saw something, and as a union president, I had people come to me and say, presidents of conferences say, Dave, please ordain these women. They're doing the work of the ministry. I said, that nah, we can't go against the world church. And so I pushed back and pushed back until E60. E60 changed everything. You said this meeting changes. E60 changed everything. Because E60 established a pure discrimination. You have women work in ministry. They can work. They can be educated. They come to a senior pastor position in the church, and they can lead a whole church as senior pastor, and they do a fantastic job. In fact, as Elder Bradford said, let women get involved in pastor ministry, and they'll show up the boys. That's exactly what Bradford said to me. I've been telling the brother in that. He, that he breathes on he, and he breathes on she. So E60 says this. A woman can work all her ministry, but come to about 20, 25 years, that's when they start picking conference presidents up. You know, anybody before 20 years, you're lucky. Or you're unlucky, whatever. <laughs> you, you can't pick a woman. No, 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 no. She can lead a church, but she can't lead a conference. That is pure discrimination. And we in the Columbia Union, we said that, you know, we, we really don't want to do that. Our ad hoc committee informed us we shouldn't go ahead, Dave, and just affirm a woman by saying, good girl, we need to ordain them. So we brought that motion in 2012 to the floor. Special session, you were there. We moved ahead. This document, I'm sorry I'm out of time. Just give me a few more moments, will you? I got just a few more minutes. Just listen. This document. One moment. What's that? It's a okay. This document violates the 1901 reorganization. Unions are responsible for their mission. Express it in your field to advance mission. We will continue to advance mission in the Columbia Union and we'll do what is right. I want to say something to the people of this body who believe that women should be treated equally to men, that they should be ordained like men, 
Are you willing to put your ordination where your mouth is? Please correct me if I'm wrong. It seems that if, let's say, a church is out of compliance, someone appeals to the conference, and the conference and that church come to an agreement, fine. What if that same person says, you know what, my conference didn't deal with it with the way that it's supposed to be. Can I go to my union then and talk to my union to deal with this church? And let's say that union and that conference and that church have come together in agreement. My difficulty with this document is that perhaps that same person can appeal to a higher level and say, general conference, can you please deal with this church? because my conference didn't do what I think that it should do, and my union has not done what I think it should do. This is my difficulty with this document. When I talked to my children about this, I tried to explain to them this document. And I said, kiddos, it's like this. There's two neighborhoods. They're right next door to each other. They both have a community pool. They have this community pool and they both have HOAs, and they both, all, these communities function very similarly. Both of the community pools have a rule that no one is to enter into the pool area while the gates are closed. One day, a little boy is drive, riding his bicycle, and he hears this noise. He hears this noise, and he looks, and he sees a little girl drowning in the pool. He jumps the fence. He jumps the fence, pulls the little girl out, and with the help of ambulance, firemen, and all the community that come together, the girl is saved. The community rejoices. The next-door neighbors want to execute the boy because he broke the rule. North America... This division must stand in solidarity for those of us who are going to jump the fence. Our young people are turning to the world to give us the things the church should be providing. It was a time of confusion. There was kingly power everywhere. The medical work was king. The publishing work was king. The general conference was king. And out of it came a 1901 convention. That resounded in 1903. I would like to represent a voice from the past. W.C. White stood in 1903. It seems to me that we must watch this thing and that we must keep in mind in adopting our Constitution and that we should bear in mind that the remedy of our confusion is not to come to the organizing of strong departments and giving them independent, yes, largely independent superior authority to operate throughout the world. But the remedy for our confusion mm -hmm. is to strengthen the union in every locality. Strengthen it in my individual heart. Strengthen it in my church. Strengthen it in my conference. Strengthen it in my union conference. And when we have done that, what is there left for a general conference to do? Why, the general conference has to look after the mission fields. The general conference, by this system of organization, is forced to become a mission board. And our general conference must leave institutional work alone. We do not want any general conference printing houses. We do not want any general conference schools. We do not want any general conference sanitariums. Our general conference is to leave institutional work alone and let union conferences attend to the work of their union conferences. And the only thing that is left for the General Conference Committee is to do the mission work. There is a principle in the universe. All authority belongs to Jesus Christ. Wherever it shows up, it's either been delegated or usurped. I suggest that the document is usurped authority. The General Conference had no place to even discuss it. And I think... My biggest concern is how long 
this division between us and the GC is going to go on. The majority of the delegates at the annual council were more interested in bringing the NAD into conformity than they were in considering the potential harm the non-compliant document has toward establishing kingly power and a police state mindset. Number two, the cry of most of those speaking in favor of the unity document was conform, conform for the sake of unity and peace. A cry that parallels Reformation times. Recant, recant for the sake of unity and peace. The truth of the Bible supersedes unity. The truth is greater than unity, and unity must be centered in Bible truth, not majority vote. Number three, the leadership of the General Conference can now have confidence that they have the votes at the GC session and annual council to do what they see as best for the church, world church. We in the NAD have 11 months to find a way to go forward in response to the GC document. At the next GC annual council and general conference session, the GC administration and delegates know they have the votes to put in place whatever they see as wisdom for the World Church, including the NAD. Number five, the GC administration can introduce new standards for the model bylaws for the operating of the World Church from division level to the local church, can instruct the GC nominating committee on guidelines it wants for the NAD leadership in the future. In a democracy, certain rights are held in high regard. Number one, the right of religious liberty. Two, the right of free speech, three, the right of assembly, four, the right to pursue happiness. These rights are protected, and a majority vote cannot take them away. In recent times, our church has, by a majority vote, taken away the historical right of local fields to decide what is best in their fields to fulfill mission. This action is called the tyranny of the majority, not democracy. Today... 18 years into the new century, we again are faced with growing pains as our organizational structure is unable to allow for enough diversity of missional methods to reach the increasing diversity of our culture in this world, and specifically the North American division. Therefore, I believe it's time to give study to again decentralize our organization in order to enhance mission. One model that's worked very well in our organization is the constituency-based organization. Conferences, unions, and general conferences have all, general conference have all benefited from constituencies. The multiple constitutions allow each entity to have self-differentiation as well as cooperation with the other entities in order to achieve mission. However, the North American Division does not have that missional advantage because we are not constituency-based. I know that having a constituency-based division may sound novel, but it is not. In fact, the South Pacific Division was constituency-based for a time. The North American Division already has some differentiation because we already have our own corporation. Mr. Chairman, I invite the writing team to consider including a motion such as this, that this body commissions a study to outline a procedure on how the North American Division could become a constituency-based organization. The study would include risks and benefits of such a change. I would request that the study be completed by the year and meetings 2019. I think it's a mistake to think that this is causing a division from North America for the rest of the world because the truth is it's causing a division right here in North America. It is splitting the people in my union. It's splitting conferences. It's splitting churches. It's even splitting families. Mark Woodson, President, Northern California Conference a non-compliant conference, and a non-compliant union. And I wear that proudly. Um, I think we need to be clear, as we're talking about this document, we're talking about compliance to policy. So many don't even understand what the policy is because you've got to read this big black book, which is not the Bible. Mm. Let's be clear about it. It's in GC Working Policy, BA 6010, which is on page 130. Tell us whether or not we're out of policy. It says this, official position. The World Church supports non-discrimination in employment practices and policies and upholds the principle that both men and women, without regard to race and color, shall be given full and equal opportunity 
within the church to develop the knowledge and skills needed for the building up of the church. Positions of service and responsibility. In parenthesis now, except those requiring ordination in the gospel ministry. <laughs> on all levels of the church, activities shall be open to all on the basis of individual qualifications. Membership and office in the local church and at various levels of administration shall be available to anyone who qualifies without regard to race, color, or gender. The appointment of individuals to serve as Bible instructors or chaplains or in departmental or pastoral responsibilities shall not be limited by race or color. Neither shall these, be, uh, these positions be limited by gender, parenthesis, except those requiring ordination to the gospel ministry. So what this tells me is we will not discriminate on anything on race, color, or gender, except this is in the working policy. We will discriminate based upon ordination. And I want to say to you that an unjust policy is no policy at all. Mr. President, I am calling for the affirmation of the need for equality, more exclusively gender equality. We need affirming statements that there is home for our female students, students accepting the call to serve a ministry that is currently rejecting them. What can I tell my students that are considering leaving our school or changing their majors because there is no future for them in our church? I myself cannot understand how our women our women can function as spiritual latency, but not as clergy. How are we qualifiable to offer spiritual guidance as educated persons, but, but not as ordained spiritual authority? Another thing, we are consistently expressing here the need to retain our members, more particularly our youth as a priority of our mission. However, many of these target groups have been left in the dark of the process of the NAD. Numerous assumptions have floated around and have become concrete in the minds of our youth. I personally have held a negative image of our conference since the release of this document because I have not heard anything from anyone until I got here. And there are many people who feel the same way. We are losing members of our church and our youth president. We need to hear from you guys. What initiatives does the NAD have to reconcile this? We believe in the spirit of prophecy. The fact that God chose a woman to convey his last day message must inform our thinking on this current conflict. There were 8 million to 10 million men, according to the 1840 U.S. Census, that God could have chosen. He chose a woman. There is a great controversy between God and Satan. I believe it's no coincidence uh, that he chose a woman. God could have given the spirit of prophecy to William Miller or to Joseph Bates or to James White, but he gave it to Ellen. Perhaps that fact alone should be weighed in the scales now occupied by scriptures too light to sway the other side's opinion. Uh, I was on the 73 uh, committee that studied the role of women in the church. We discovered that there was no theological objection to the ordination of women. I believe that each committee that has been assigned since has overwhelmingly had the same result as our committee. I think it's important for us to call for conversation. To my knowledge, there has not been conversation since the 73 conference that I was part of. And conversation doesn't take place in two-minute bites with 400 people or 2,000 people. It takes place in smaller groups. This may be the tip of the iceberg, that intrusion into our, our administration uh, may become more and more common if we don't find a way of dealing with this situation. I think we need to find a way of reorganization, as several others have suggested, that, that reaffirms our unity with church doctrine, but finds ways by which we can carry out our ministry and our field without an intrusion from other fields. We must be committed to the biblical mandate of the priesthood of all believers, to the understanding of the church as Christ's body consisting of diverse parts called and gifted for serving him equally in unity. 
and the pr uh, principle of the biblical human equality. The Desire of Ages, pages, page 82, says, All to whom the heavenly inspiration has come are put in trust with the gospel. All who receive the life of Christ are ordained to the work for the salvation of their fellow men. For this work, the church was established, and all who take upon themselves its sacred vows are thereby pledged to be co-workers with Christ. We must celebrate all women and men in ministry and affirm equally and without reservation all those who demonstrate the gifts and fruits of the Holy Spirit in serving Jesus and others. In light of the October 14, 2018 General Conference Council action approving a punitive oversight process, rather than shrink in acquiescence to institutional pressure, we must stand in obedience to Jesus' commandments of human equal status in all respects in his radical kingdom. There is no provision for hierarchical rule in the Church of Jesus Christ, nor for human caste systems in his ministry of service. For this reason, we must officially register deep disappointment and a disapproval of the votes of the 2015 General Conference session that prohibited the equal status of women in clergy and the 2018 General Conference Annual Council action that approved the formation of the General Conference ADCOM's establishment of compliance committees to monitor and enforce policies and practices with punitive measures to be applied to deemed offenders. I believe that this is not a distraction from mission. This is our mission today in North America. We have been called to this time and this place for this purpose of making sure that all members, all clergy who are called by God, are a part of that mission equally. This is a modern day paraphrase and it has an Adventist twist and it goes something like this. First, they came for those who were not in compliance with women's ordination. But I was in compliance and so I said nothing. And then they came for those who were not in compliance with certain worship styles. Mm. But I was in compliance, and so I said nothing. And then they came for those who did not demonstrate a vegetarian lifestyle. <laughs> but I was in compliance, and so I said nothing. And then they came for me. Mm. And there was no one left to speak. I challenge the North American Division leadership, the unions, the conferences, the institutions that are represented here today to take a stand, to reject this form of governance, to affirm equality in ministry. And if that puts us out of compliance, we're in good company. Because there was another German theologian by the name of Martin, and I think we can stand along with him and say, here we stand, we can do no other, so help us God. Amen. And so it concerns me that the problem that is seen, most of us who have spoken in some way in defense of women in ministry have been construed as rebels and as cancers that need to be cut out of the body at times. So I typed in comply, and it does appear one time in Scripture. It appears in a verse that says, Mordecai refused to comply. <laughs> and I stand before you today as a woman, as an under 35 year old, as a mother, as a Midwesterner, as an Adventist high school teacher, and as a former pastor. And I have a couple of things to say. I first want to say that I don't want to speak, but I feel compelled to speak. I wholeheartedly reject the compliance document that was voted at annual council. And I call upon our division leadership to reject it. In fact, I call upon all 13 of our division executive committees to reject a document which places far too much power in the hands of a few and does not allow for the collective decisions re reached as constituents of a particular region on matters of disputed belief to determine what works in their context. I also have to say this because I was a woman pastor. I feel it is so shameful for my church leadership to act in a way that continues to inflict wounds on an already disenfranchised portion of our church body. 
How disappointing that my church continues to ignore the obvious call of God in the lives of these many women who serve as pastors. With this kind of reception from the church they love, who but woman called of God would dare to serve? They need every ounce of strength and grace from he who has called them to stand in the face of such ridicule and deplorable treatment. Who would sign up for this willingly but for the call of God? And my church to give up the pride of the male ego collectively, to recognize men don't hold the corner market on God's call to lead. It is time to let the scales fall from our eyes and bear witness to the Spirit of God falling on our sons and our daughters. To the GC leaders, I would say, please reject the temptation of hierarchy and hold others up so that in doing this, you may be the servant leader that Jesus has called us all to be. Thank you. And for us as a body at North American Division, it is not rebellious to affirm previous policies, previous actions, and to reject this document and say, we cannot accept that a general conference wants to control us. They are to serve us, not to direct us and control us. And so it is right for us in the writing committee to put in there that we refuse to follow this document or reject it as being unacceptable because general conference does not have authority to control our behaviors. They are there to help us and serve us in our mission and in our fundamental beliefs. And, but this document is way out of line. And so I hope that we will include there that we turn this away and find other ways to move forward. Number 14, it's called the unity in the body of Christ. The church is one body with many members called from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. In Christ, we are a new creation, distinctions of race, culture, Learning, we'll get into that one later on in the, in the meetings. Nationality and differences between high and low, rich and poor, male and female, must not be divisive among us. We are all equal in Christ, who by one spirit has bonded us into one fellowship with him and with one another. We are to serve and be served without partiality or reservation. Through the revelation of Jesus Christ in the scriptures, we share the same faith and hope and reach out in one witness to all. This unity has its source in the oneness of the triune God who has adopted us as his children. I would suggest that one of the dilemmas we have is when we have a policy that is in contradiction with the doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I must tell you that it fills me with shame. when members of my congregation frustratedly ask why they were not visited by a real pastor. And I believe that my voice can be complicit in pointing out the difference between them as commissioned and myself as ordained. And I'm not okay with it. And finally, I'd like to point out that our work needs our young people desperately. So for those nearly 15 young ladies who are in school for ministry at Southern right now, I must stand and express that you are my equal in your calling. And for my two daughters, Emily and Alyssa, I beg you to be patient. I would lay down my life for you, and I would lay down my ordination for you. Please, may we take seriously this moment, for as we look back, this may be a tipping point where both our young men and women decided that we discriminated in a way that is not godly. I have never been embarrassed by my church until now. It's embarrassing to have a document like this circulating, saying that this is what we believe. This is not what we all believe. And um, 
I'd just like to say also I pastored a number of churches uh, throughout the North American Division, and many of those churches were run by women. And they weren't ordained. They didn't even probably think about pastoring, but they were doing pastoral ministry. And those churches would have, if they uh, would have closed, they're not step forward to do something. So I just wonder, I think sometimes we've made the uh, church hard to get into. We're making it even harder now. We're making it hard now to even remain a Seventh-day Adventist from what I hear. And so I just plead with, with this body and with any higher organization that we make it easier for people to accept Jesus. At the time of the vote, having watched it and it having passed, I was very discouraged uh, for a while. Um, and coming from La Silla University, a conference that we were a part of, a president is an ordained woman. And I had the chance to meet with her prior to these meetings. And instantly, while during our conversation, I was very encouraged that her and her leadership and her focus was something that I could get behind as someone that was once discouraged. I wanted to uh, express a concern of the five committees to be formed, one of which is doctrine, policy statements, and guidelines regarding, regarding homosexuality. I think in line with that, we'll say LGBTQ. I would hope that we affirm the specified demographic as brothers and sisters in Christ. I understand that there are varying views that exist in this topic, but I also understand there is pain that has existed from the church and felt by them. My concern is that this document and committee potentially perpetuate that pain. And as we see it, no longer is there room for intolerance, oppression, or exclusion from the salvation and love Jesus Christ opened the doors to, and the ministry layperson, ministers, and administration have been called to. And I plead with you all here today that we openly consider all of the demographics and all of the items that are plaguing our church today. We should never forget that everything Adolf Hitler did to the Jews in Germany was legal. It was illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. When a law is unjust, every law that supports it is also unjust. When a policy is unjust, every policy that supports it is also unjust. The policy before us today is unjust because the policy which it supports, the one which institutionalizes and discrimination against women in ministry, is unjust, unbiblical, and unscriptural. Any policy... This policy and any other that supports injustice is contrary to the gospel and must be rejected. This policy should be rejected because it attempts to sustain what is unsustainable discrimination in the body of Christ. Two or four unions have chosen to ordain women to the gospel ministry in compliance with both Old and New Testament. Mm. Mm. Joel 2, 28 and 29 said, In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Pentecost was a fulfillment of this prophecy. It is ironic that we as a church have extolled Ellen White to the prophetic role, and at the same time, we are rejecting her counsel on the role of women. If we embrace this document that was voted in Battle Creek, what do we say to our youth and young adults, and what do we say to our women who are convinced that they are being called to the gospel ministry? The, the Unity Commission did not achieve their goal. 
there is no unity in regarding this document. The document declares itself illegitimate because it has not achieved unity. Therefore, any enforcement of the compliance of any of the words in here are negated by the last four lines of the document. In rejecting the document, we're not going to create unity in our division either. It's been expressed here that both at a conference, union, and local church level that there's division, which means that even in our own division, we're not unified on this. All of our daughters are crying. Like, and that starts with the NAD hearing each other's stories and deciding to be unified together and not just making another statement, but doing something. And so I want to defend Ellen a little bit today. Do it real quick. Please stop taking her out of context. Don't use lines when it's only convenient. Stop saying things that she never said. Our young people think that we are schizophrenic. <laughs> we say that we, we quote her often, every other line, but then we're not supportive of women. It does not make sense to them. The greatest want of the world is the want of men. Men who will not be bought or sold. Men who in their innermost souls are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the need to the pole. Men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. And on behalf of our women clergy, I say thank you to all of the men in this room who stand for the right even though you may lose your jobs. God bless you, and we continue to move forward with women in ministry. The document that is being, uh, that we have in our hand, uh, is meant to bring unity, but is being used as a weapon against women in leadership. Too many women are being asked to leave as local elders, as Sabbath school leaders, and as other leaders female leaders in our local churches. There's a segment of our population that's using this document to, to hurt all women. I would recommend that we find a way, a method to affirm our members to support our women in leadership, and that we do not allow our church to perpetuate this behavior. We have become ecclesiastical Republicans and Democrats, fighting for fighting's sake. I have a PhD, and one of the things I was asked to do in, develop, in, in working in that PhD is to describe my favorite philosopher and to, to demonstrate um, in my ministry my favorite philosopher. So I'd like to share with you a quote from my favorite philosopher. His name is Rodney King. Can't we just get along? <laughs> One should be able to pick up the sense of the calm but certain attitude of the leadership of the North American Division at this juncture in history. I recommend that the NAD Executive Committee recognizes the right of the constituents of unions in our territory to authorize the ordination of women in their territory. I would recommend that the NAD form a committee to study and develop a plan to determine how the General Conference can be in compliance with the fundamental belief number 14, to serve and be served without partiality or reservation. This compliance to our fundamental belief, which says the distractions of male and female must not be divisive among us, would allow us to share the same faith and hope and reach out in one witness to all. I'd like to encourage our writing committee to consider whatever their response is, to be careful not to let it be something that could set a precedent that would go down the line to local churches and how they respond to their conferences. Okay, that's because a good they comment, are the you. base of the Adventist church. Let's face it, the North American division is not homogeneous on this idea. We are not. We have division within the division. 
several have made the comment, we need to have discussion. And that probably is one of the things that we need to focus more intentionally on. I guess of what I would call the drift in our church towards a top-down power. At not the entire North American division is not out of compliance. It sounds like we all are, but we're not. Uh, there are two unions that are and a number of conferences. But we should also stipulate that the being out of compliance is not just to be out of compliance, just to be out of compliance. It is a matter of conscience for us. And I think that has to be included because I think the concern that individuals are having is, well, can we just now as a church break off and do whatever we want or as a conference do whatever we want? This issue and this particular policy that we are out of compliance with, some of us are out of compliance with, has to do with conscience not being overtaken by a policy. I would you mean propose, any ordination? Yes, I would propose that we remove the ordination we are having now and create something else. To uh, actually have town hall meetings where discussions are taking place about what it means to be diverse and inclusive inside of our conferences and inside of our unions and inside of the division uh, with regard to the way that we speak, the way that we act, and the way we care for our brethren in a unified manner. I believe it is time for the North American division to do what Jesus did. And he pitched his tent with those of us who were non-compliant. Our church has made our unions, the Columbia and the Pacific, the poster child of, of everything bad in the world church. It is time for us to let the rest of the church know that it's not that we don't support them because we have not gone just totally in, in support of women's ordination by demonstration, by practice. It is only out of a spirit of, of trying to maintain some kind of a balance. I haven't put all the words together, but what I'm trying to say is we need to encircle these unions and let the church know, not the division, but let the church know that we're one family here. We have made them the poster child. Let them know that the Columbia Union and the Pacific Union do not stand alone. Amen. They that's do not point. stand alone. That, 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 that's a good point. Within the unions that have had um, uh, coordination, non-coordination, there's always unity among them. Could we not, as a division, appeal to the unions in this great division to own their mission in a way they will not stand for non for discrimination in their fields. That they will you just put it out there, let them decide. Let unions decide. They own the mission. Let them decide what it means to non discriminate. Be to go back to the original study that was done by our own theologians, where they were not unanimous in their opinion about how to do biblical interpretation relative to this particular issue and that it was perfectly fine to take both opinions and both ways of biblical interpretation. And if we would start there and recognize the fact that it was studied, that we do have an official pronouncement on that. I believe some of the folk are here. I see Gordon Beats sitting right over here who is a part of that committee. Um, it might lay a bedrock for a foundation of where we're going on something that was clearly put together and put together for us in a way that let us understand this is a cultural issue, this is not a biblical interpretation issue, and everything that flows from that has kind of gone downhill since. But I also believe what uh, another brother said earlier, that since 1973 they've been studying this, the issue, and I think it's high time that we also use stronger language, like the words discrimination in this document in some way, that we as a division are standing up against that. That as the document is written, that we try to use as much as possible biblical language. I can hear already, because this document will be read by other parts um, outside of the NAD, I can hear them reading words like uh, um, equality, justice, immediately say, oh, you see, those are Western values, and missing the point that this is about conscience. So as much as possible, using biblical language that both sides can relate to will um, facilitate the conversation.
Nothing that we have suggested here today is going to bring about unity. Nothing on the other side would bring about unity either. And it reminded me of the story of Solomon where he said one woman says it's my child, the other woman says no, it's my child. And so he said to him, cut it in half and give half to each woman. And the real mother submitted herself, sacrificed her rights as the mother and said, no, give it to her because her desire was that the baby would live, not that her rights would be achieved, but the baby would live. The baby today is the prophetic movement of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And so I would appeal to the committee to remember that we are prophetically called into existence as a worldwide movement. And our mission is not to make sure that everybody is equal socially. Our mission is to make sure that everybody is equal spiritually. What's driving all these documents and this whole process that we have been through for so many years is the headship theology. Since when did the headship theology become doctrine? In fact, the 1973 study did not consider headship because it wasn't there. It wasn't until 1980 when headship started creeping in, and now it has become a, the norm. So I would say let's go back to where we maybe got lost on the road and we took all these forks on the road and go back to what actually led us to have such diversity of thought in this. And I believe it has to do with our understanding of headship. I wish to appeal to North America to use careful language, mm. to, to express thoughts that, are, that, brings us, that brings us together. I, I want to express appreciation to the women that have been serving in ministry. I voted for the ordination of women in 1990, in 1995, and in 2015. That's my personal conviction. My warning is, in all of the things that the writing committee and the NID administration and this body can do, in the next few hours and days. I apologize for running out of time. Would you give me one more? No, 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 you keep yeah. going, please. Um, in, 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 in looking at everything that has to be done, I would like to really advise that we, that we go s slow on, on uh, language that will indicate separation. Let me say it this way. <clears throat> we are flying a plane. Let's make sure we do not destroy the plane while we are flying. These, deconstruct, deconstructing the church in some fashion, it will not help. I think we need to we need, to, we need to bring the forces together. Um, you will find that there are many of us that are more than willing to help in that effort. And I believe when I hear uh, the them and the us and, you know, the... Um, somehow, we are going to have to come to the center. I like to see in that document something that states the cultural verses that are given to other divisions. Somehow we need to have that in the document because why is it that North American division is singled out when there are cultural variances given to other divisions? That's very yeah. important. But I do speak on behalf of many members who would consider themselves on the more conservative wing of Adventism in North America. Many feel disenfranchised by the changes we see happening in our division, 
particularly the influx of pro-LGBTQ activities, um, often of it, much of it informal in our division. And um, as I travel around the world, I work in about 24 countries, I'm realizing that the world is not static. There are many people in Africa, there are many people in Latin America who are in favor of the ordination of women. And I believe that those attitudes are changing in favor around the world, as I see it, of the ordination of women. If we push ahead with it now, regard and put aside the votes of the world church, we're sending a message to every church member that no matter what your local church board votes, no matter what your conference votes, you can simply ignore it and claim conscience. I believe that if we were to have a dialogue with the rest of the world church and allow time and space in our own local churches here in North America, we would come to some kind of understanding. That understanding is growing around the world. And if we push ahead with it now, we destroy our government system in our Adventist church. So I would like to make a recommendation that the writing committee um, request that this come back on the GC agenda in 2025 to give us time for dialogue with the world church so that when we make a decision, we can do it in unity and we can uphold how we make decisions in our world church.